everybody uh, joining us today we have son son brings over 25 years of visual effects production experience yeah. as an artist manager trainer and supervisor he has an impressive list of credits on films such as lord of rings x men the golden compass cloud atlas and transformers to name a few son has a long son has been long interested in training and mentoring building training programs at many of the studios he has worked at uh, worked at including method vancouver and cinesite montreal so he is currently a uh, lead houdini instructor at lost boys school of vfx in montreal senior cg supervisor at cinesite montreal so without any further delay let's listen to uh, son talking about learning strategies for new students Thank you, Krishna Veni. So, uh, Krishna Veni's actually uh, basically done my whole self introduction. So, I'll I'll just skip that myself. Uh, so, um, like she said, my name is Sean Lukey, and I'm here to talk about learning strategies for new students. So, I've now been teaching visual effects here at Lost Boys in Montreal for about four years. Um, but as she said, I've been long interested and long involved in all sorts of training programs at uh, pretty much every studio that I worked at. So I'm going to start by sharing um, my screen. Okay, so the first thing, um, you know, as a lecturer or as a student, you're going to, to find is that, you know, lecturers love to lecture. And lecturers, you know, it's, it's the easiest way for us as lecturers to deliver content to students. Um, for students, not so much. I mean, this is not a great way uh, for people to learn. Studies have shown, you know, time and time again, that passively listening to lectures is not a great way to retain knowledge. You need to both listen and then practice what you heard. So sitting in front of a class um, and just listening um, for hours and hours at a time is probably not the best way to learn something like uh, a 3D package. Um, there is a, a German psychologist named Hermann Ebbinghaus, um, and he's suggesting the way to learn something and to retain it is uh, after you've received the material, you spend 10 minutes reviewing it within 24 hours of having received it, add five minutes to refresh it seven days later, and then on day 30, spend two to four minutes to completely reactivate the same material. Um, so how does this translate into studying for VFX, which is often delivered via discrete lectures and um, and continuously, uh, you know, or you're, you're, you know, something you're learning on YouTube or, oops, this should be looping. Okay. So obviously the first thing you should do is, is you know, duplicate the techniques that you've described in the lecture. So uh, after you've heard the lecture, you've got to obviously go back to your desk and, and try to do what they showed you in the lecture or in the tutorial. Um, but, you know, I hear all the time the students say, well, I can do what you tell me to do and I can do exactly what you tell me to do and I can follow the tutorial, but I don't know what to do with it then. I can't use it myself. I, I don't really understand what I'm doing. Um, well, you should take the, the, the techniques that we just described and apply them to something slightly different in other words, uh, for example, here you see some uh, one of our students, Nathan Milieu, he did a, a squib hit, so a ground hit uh, digital asset. Um, so this was a lecture that we did at Lost Boys, and then uh, he put it in the scene with some um, some Mixamo characters. So now once he's, he's basically duplicated what uh, we did in class, he should go back to his desk, obviously, put it into a scene, make it work. Uh, but then he should take the same technique and perhaps make a wall hit. So now it has to hit something vertical instead of something horizontal. Or maybe it's no longer a wall hit, it's a water splash. So just by changing a few parameters, you could you could make this look like water or something. So you've got to take what you learn and just tweak it slightly. And that's going to help you, uh, help you find out if you actually know and understand uh, what you've done. Uh, so another strategy that um, I strongly recommend is that you write things down. Okay, so this is me. Um, I've been asked the same thing for the 10th time. And I'm like, oh, have you written this down? If you don't write things down, uh, you have a much 
a smaller chance of remembering them. So all my career, I've, I've, I've kept a notebook of uh, little tips and tricks. I now don't keep a notebook. I put it on a Google a wiki or a, a Google a site. Uh, so every little thing, every link, every technique, every little bit of code I've learned, I put it into this wiki in a well-organized place. Um, there is nothing uh, worse than knowing that you know something but not being able to remember how you know it or where you put it. So please write it down, put it somewhere, super important. And um, it's okay to not understand everything. Sometimes you have to you know, just say, okay, I don't understand this, I've tried my best, I've, I'm gonna put it in a box, I'm gonna come back to it later. Um, and and perhaps later I will understand it. Don't you know? Don't stop learning because you don't get something at this point. Um, there's an expression: uh, we learn to skate in the summer and swim in the winter. So what does that mean? Um, well, obviously in India you don't learn to skate in the summer, um, but in Canada uh, we do learn to skate here. Um, and of course, traditionally you learn to skate in the winter and you swim in the summer. Um, but often you'll be learning something, uh, perhaps you've learned to ride a bicycle, um, and at the end of the bicycling season, you say, um, well, I'm really not very good at riding a bicycle, I'm, I'm actually really rubbish. Uh, and then next spring comes around, you hop back on the bicycle, and you still know how to ride a bicycle, and in fact, you can ride a bicycle better than you could last fall. So how did that happen? Well, you learned a whole bunch of other stuff in the meantime. You've learned uh, maybe how to ride a scooter, or you learned how to actually skate, or you've learned something that that's not directly related to uh, what you were trying to learn, but it all helps to reinforce the, the things that you've already learned. So you're going to find this happens in visual effects. You're going to go, oh, I don't get it, I don't get it. You come back to it six months later and go, actually, I do get it because I've now learned all this other stuff. So if you don't learn it immediately, come back to it later, you might find that you actually do understand it. Your knowledge will accumulate and reinforce itself over time. And in, as, indeed, as teachers, we are often, you know, we need to simplify and generalize to the point of almost lying. So it's said that teaching is telling a series of small lies. Um, I recall uh, having to teach uh, a bunch of students who'd never encountered 3D in their lives uh, how to use Houdini. And at that point, I just realized, you know, just how much knowledge I assumed that people had, like even tumbling the scene in a three-dimensional way was completely alien to them. Uh, so, you know, I couldn't tell them every single thing about the package we were learning, which was Houdini. I had to really simplify it. In other words, I had to tell some small lies. And perhaps you have to do this to yourself too. You, you'll, you, at some point you say, okay, uh, well, this is really all I need to know at this point about this thing, and I'll come back to it later when uh, I'm ready to learn more and I've really um, integrated the knowledge I have at this point. Okay, so how, you know, so next we're going to talk about how to be good at anything or how to be good at at visual effects in particular. So how do we take what I've, I've talked about of reviewing, refreshing, and reactivating? How do we, you know, how, what makes one person more successful than the other? So there's a computer scientist named Paul Graham. He says this would feature three ingredients. It's natural ability, practice, and effort. You probably intuitively already understand that. So you can do pretty well with two, but to your best work, you need all three. You need great natural ability. You have to practice a lot, and you have to be trying very hard. So Bill Gates, who had plenty of smarts, I never took a day off in my 20s, not one. So great talent and great drive are both rare, and people with both are extremely rare. Most people will have a, uh, a lot of one and less of the other, but you'll need both if you want to be an outlier yourself. And since you can't really change how much talent you have, the practice doing great work reduces to working very hard. And at the end of the day, that's it. Um, you have to work really, really hard. And you might have heard of the uh, book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. So practice isn't the thing you do once you're good, okay? Practice is what you do to become good. Um, so in, in his book, Gladwell, you know, always refers to this 10,000-hour rule. So how did the Beatles become, you know, the greatest band of their time? Well, they played 
thousands and thousands, more than 10,000 hours of uh, gigs in bars in Germany and all across Europe until they became just great musicians. So the key to achieving true expertise and skill is simply a matter of practicing, although in the correct way for at least 10,000 hours now. How much is 10,000 hours? 1,248 eight-hour days or 3.5 years, of no holidays. So to become an expert in the field, well, if you plan to you know, breathe and take weekends off, probably five years of, of really, really hard work. And another uh, great quote that I found uh, recently as I was reading this book called The Code Book, and this is talking about how the Allies cracked the Nazi uh, World War II codes. Um, and I, I just love this quote. He's, they're talking about a one of the guys who worked on the Enigma project. His name was Ralph. I forget his last name. He he was willing to be a fool, okay, to get to the tops of the heap in terms of developing original research is to be a fool because only fools keep trying. You get idea number one, you get excited and it flops. Okay. So this is just like in CG, you think, ah, oh, I know how to do this explosion or I know how to do this water effect and you try it and it doesn't look good. Okay. So you have idea number two, you get excited. It doesn't work either. You have idea number 99, you get excited and it flops. Okay. Only a complete fool would be excited by the 100th idea, but it might take 100 times until one really pays off. So unless you're foolish enough to be continually excited, you won't have the motivation, you won't have the energy to carry it through. So God rewards fools. I distinctly recall when I was working on The Lord of the Rings uh, in way back in the year 2000, and uh, we were trying to do a smoke effect for the Belrog, and uh, we had some software which was brand new at the time. It was a fluid dynamic software. And basically, it would explode 99 times out of 100. Uh, many people came and went from that project <clears throat> who, you know, after the 40th explosion, they just kind of gave up and they didn't want to be involved anymore. Uh, the people who succeeded were the ones who, you know, who were being the fools, who would say, well, it's, it's blown up 99 times. Maybe on the 100th time, it won't blow up. So what does this mean? Iterate. In in CG terms, this is doing iterations. Uh, and you can tell this is an important concept because of the way the slide slid in there. I, I saved these visual effects for the most important things. Um, iterate, iterate, iterate. Do tests. Do wedge tests. So wedge testing is the process of making small changes and looking at the outcome. So this is something you're expected to do in production, and this is something that uh, supervisors appreciate. This is something that is going to be super important in your career. Iterate, iterate, iterate. Uh, don't just do one version of something and go, hey, that looks pretty good. We'll do 10 versions of it with 10 different random uh, seeds in it. And one of them might look better than the other just by pure chance. Um, this is one thing that separates the good artists from the great artists. The, the ones who who do iterations, who do tests, who keep trying again and again and again, even when they're saying, well, that looks pretty good. I'll just present this now. Well, while you're waiting, why don't you just do a few more iterations? And I can't stress that enough. This can make, this can really be the difference between a good artist and a great artist. Uh, having said all that, <clears throat> try not to get too ambitious. I see this all the time uh, from my students is, uh, the, you know, this is this process of building photoreal um, visual effects is a lot harder than it looks. Uh, we often have my, our, my students are trying to to make their own film or uh, duplicate the effects that they saw in a Marvel film. Don't try to make a film. Don't try to blow up the world the first time. Make something simple that looks great rather than something that's super complex that doesn't look great. Small, contained. Uh, projects are a lot better than making a six shot sequence or trying to blow up a skyscraper. Finish your projects as you go. Don't wait to the last minute to try to jam them all in. Don't work on two, more than two or three things at a time. It's really hard to focus. It's really hard to, to, uh, to, to get things done. And take, you know, if you think, take your estimate and triple it and then change it uh, to the unit the next one up. So an example, for example, you say, oh, I think this will take three days. Well, if you've ever worked in production, 
you know, uh, triple it, that's nine, and then take it to the next unit, that's weeks. So what you think will take three days will probably take you nine weeks. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'm telling you, work hard, work hard, work hard. Well, at the same time, you should try to be lazy as well. Well, say lazy maybe isn't the best way to, to put it. Be efficient. Uh, you know, well, that's great advice. What, what what does that mean in practice? Well, don't be the person who wants to spend, 15, you know, doesn't want to spend 15 minutes making a more efficient testing scenario and then wasting hours and hours on something that's needlessly slow. For example, um, Let's say that you have to, uh, you've got a fluid simulation and you have to, you have to skin it. So right now it's a bunch of particles and you have to actually skin it so that it looks like fluid. Now using the fluid surfacing node uh, can be very, very slow if you've got 15 million particles or 500 million particles. Well, just take a tiny little portion of that um, simulation, just delete 95% of it and just skin a little bit that, you know, right in front of your face until that looks good. Uh, so every time you make a change to the skinning algorithm, maybe it will take uh, 10 seconds to update instead of, you know, five minutes. So imagine how many more iterations you can get, um, you know, just by, you know, doing it every 10 seconds instead of every five minutes. You will just simply run out of time at some point. Um, and you're much more likely to stumble upon the correct result if you've been able to do many, many revisions. So, and this comes up all the time. There's people who uh, don't want to save their simulations to disk. In other words, the simulation is live and they send it to go to render. And of course, every time it renders, it has to re-simulate the scene. You know, don't be the person who doesn't want to spend five minutes, uh, you know, setting up a more efficient scenario uh, that will save them literally hours and hours uh, later. So think of it this way. If you can do 10 iterations of something at the same time another artist can only do two, who do you think is going to have the better work? So in my experience, again, I've seen this time and time again, there are less talented artists who are better at the job because of this ability to make their work efficient. So what does this mean? Like, again, in practice, uh, looking at my, that uh, meme on the right, do you send your uh, renders to the farm at 4K the first time? No, you do a low res, low quality test render first. Do 10 low quality test renders before you send that 4K render to, the, to your render farm or you know, using up your CPU all night. If you're in Houdini, you use the performance monitor. You cache to disk as much as possible. You do proof of concepts first. If you're simulating, you start small, small bounty boxes, large voxel sizes, lightweight or no collision objects, and just work on a small portion of your data until you're sure it's working. So if you have some grand idea about some effect you're doing, don't build the whole effect with all the bells and whistles and then oh, it doesn't work and you've got the super complicated setup you can't even debug. Work, Make it work on a sphere and, and a grid before you make it work um, on the final effect. Um, next, I'd say, uh, you know, be, be a craftsman, um, not an artist. So what does that mean? Um, well, in, a, in, in production, you know, as, as when you're on your own, you can be an artist. We are all artists. All of us visual effects artists are artists. The, you know, the word artist is in the name. So obviously we are artists. But please don't be an artist on my time. OK, I am, let's say, the, the visual effects supervisor. And this is more about talking about when you, you, know, you get your first job and you're continuing to learn. So we're building a product. We have tremendous leeway in building that product. It involves a lot of creativity and artistic talent. But I have a client to please. OK, the client has given you your marching orders. So this is what I want. If you disagree with something, make your point and move on. OK, you're part of a team. You're here to realize someone else's vision. What would the film look like if every person had to realize their artistic vision? So you are a craftsman. Uh, imagine if um, the plumber came to your house and he said, you know, I don't like the plumbing codes. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to I want water to flow uphill. Well, you don't want your plumber doing that. You want your plumber to be you know, doing things uh, in, an, in an accepted way uh, that's going to work. So some of the, or at least one of the most miserable people in visual effects that I know is someone who is always complaining about his artistic vision not being um, respected. Well, you're, you're not 
here to realize your artistic vision. You're here to realize somebody else's artistic vision. There is a lot of creative leeway in there for you to, to be creative, but there's not a lot of room for you to, to just build something completely uh, with your artistic vision. And Bill Gates himself talked about the value of this. There's a tremendous amount of craftsmanship between having a great idea and having a great product. And that's where you come in. If someone's had a great idea, you have to make a great product. And it's up to you to be a great crafts person to do this. So when I used to work at uh, Method in Vancouver, um, I used to walk past this building, 201 West uh, 11th Avenue in Vancouver, and I would see this sign every day. And I would think, like, who who did this? How you know what what were they thinking when they did this? Did they think this was an acceptable result? And from the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, there's this great quote, you know, care and quality are internal and external aspects of the same thing. A person who, who sees quality and feels it as he works is a person who cares. And a person who cares about what he sees and does is a person who's bound to have some characteristics of quality. And this is probably a no-brainer for people in the visual effects industry. You, you, you probably do care very, very deeply about what you're doing and about your product. So, but I think... At the time in your career when you no longer care, that's when you're going to see your the quality of your work decline. So that's when you 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 realize maybe it's time to to, to get out of <laughs> get out of the industry if, if you no longer care. Um, now you're gonna if you if you ever look on the internet um, and uh, you look for motivational quotes or how to be motivated or how to learn something, you'll see this kind of quote, like fall in love with the process and the results will come. Well, this is not, not my favorite quote in the world. Uh, I see all, you know, I see this a lot in a lot of students and artists. And uh, as someone who specializes in teaching Houdini, I especially see it in Houdini artists for some reason. Um, People love to build machines that make things. So in other words, um, if you've got a tool that's supposed to make, as we saw earlier, a ground hit or a ground hit explosion, um, people will spend a lot of time building an interface and building, uh, working on the process and tidying up their node networks and forgetting that the most important thing is, is the results. It's not the process, the results. There are people who will uh, insist that everything they do be completely procedural, meaning completely, uh, you know, a reusable uh, and uh, working like a machine with every single um, parameter uh, you know, bug checked and, and backed up with uh, logic in case the user does something wrong. And then there'll be somebody else who just gets on with it and makes something look looks great without building a huge tool that nobody else will ever see. So, Remember, the most important thing is not your node network or your, your file that you're working on. No one's going to see your Houdini or your Maya or your, your, your Blender file. Um, people are only going to see the result. So, of course, this, this is the absolute number one thing is referring to reference. Okay. Um, Depending on what you're doing, but especially if you're if you if you want to be a visual effects artist, you want to be an effects artist. You've got to always be referring to reference. So, uh, when you're making your demo reel, uh, you're working on something. Take a real world example and try to match that. Uh, start with something simple and um, make sure that you, you are always working to a real world reference. Don't just work to something that you think you remember. Um, because you probably remember it incorrectly. Uh, early in my career, I had to build a lightning effect, and uh, like a fool, not the good kind of fool, just the stupid kind of fool, I um, didn't bother to look at reference, uh, well, moving reference. I looked at still images, and um, when I showed the, the uh, effect to my supervisor, they said, well, I don't think that's how um, lightning moves. I think, well, I think it is. Uh, and of course, after we looked at it, I realized that you know, the way I, it was moving was completely incorrect. Um, had I spent literally one minute looking something up on the internet, uh, I wouldn't have had that problem. So there's this great um, uh, example here, and I'll, I'll provide the link in a second. of Somebody who asked people to draw bicycles from memory without looking at a bicycle. 
So on the left is a picture of their bicycle, on the right is the, um, the you know, he built them in 3D to see what they would look like. And you can see a lot of people, uh, you know, everyone would recognize a bicycle if they saw it, but if you actually had to build one without looking at reference, you're gonna get some pretty bizarre results. As you can see here, a lot of things that are mechanically impossible or just plain uh, ridiculous. So uh, this artist is uh, Gianluca Gimini. So, uh, and there's the uh, reference if you want to look it up on the Wired. Um, we're running very low of time, but um, one other thing I'd like to talk about is uh, we had a uh, visual effects supervisor once come in from Atomic Fiction. I forget his name now, but he uh, had a really good uh, idea about how to, you know, as a, as an artist, how to how do you frame your 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 design process if you're if you're asked to build an effect? Well, he said, well, why don't you think like a manga artist? How should you know? Imagine if you had to make an explosion. Well, you know, get out a piece of paper and draw it. Draw, draw a picture of an explosion, like this cartoon version of an explosion. Make sure you have this beautiful shape, this beautiful profile. Make sure that at, at some point it just looks beautiful. It just it looks arresting. If, if your effect never hits that one of those key poses, uh, it's not working. So remember, your demo reel, and pretty much only your reel, is what's going to get you your first job. Not a fancy resume, not a really cool cover letter just your demo rail. So you have to be thinking about that all the time. So I'm almost finished now. Let's just review the, what, what we have, what I've, I've said so far. So here's the 10 commandments of learning visual effects. Review what you've learned. What I mean by that is take what you've learned and apply it to something slightly different. Write it down, write everything down that you learned, either on a piece of paper in a notebook or on a wiki or something like that. So adapt the tutorials you've done and make something slightly different. Iterate and wedge test, iterate, iterate, iterate. Don't get too ambitious. Be efficient, okay? Be a craftsperson. Refer to reference, always, always refer to reference. Think like a manga artist and it's all, oops, it's all about your reel. No, it's all about your reel. Um, that's, that's it at the end of the day. Your reel is what's gonna get you your job. Uh, that's pretty much uh, my presentation for today. So if you have any comments or questions, feel free to look me up at my address is Sean at lostboysstudios.com. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Sean, uh, for your time. It was a great session. So we have some questions from our end. Uh, so let's uh, jump into it. So we have a question. Uh, what is uh, the right age of, for a student to identify their true calling and how to make the best use of the opportunity? Well, what the, the right age? Um, well, I didn't get started in visual effects until I was almost 30 years old. So uh, I spent uh, <clears throat> my youth uh, doing the wrong thing. Uh, spent my youth doing a lot of really uh, weird jobs. I was actually uh, at one point a brakeman for the, the Canadian National Railway. Uh, so I don't know what the right age is, but um, it's never too late is one thing I would say. Yeah, so we have one more question. Can we teach creativity to someone who has no background and purpose? <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't think you could really teach creativity to people. Um, but in some ways, it, let, let's say you recognize that you're not a creative person, um, you can leverage other talents. Like, for example, I, you know, uh, in some ways I am a creative person, but if you compared me to some superstar, a uh, visual effects superstar or an artist, you know, I pale in comparison. Uh, however, I have been um, successful in my career because I've leveraged other talents. So let's say you, you acknowledge that you're not a creative person. Well, maybe you're going to be the person that takes um, uh, the brief from the client and you're going to build a tool that other artists can use, other artists that are more creative than you. And it will give you feedback, say, okay, I need these extra controls, I need these extra things. So maybe the place for you in visual effects is as a tool builder or, or as um, a pipeline person or something. There's a place for you as long as you're willing to, uh, you know, put in, uh, put in put your, life, your life and blood into it. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for uh, joining us today. So uh, 
the time is up and we need to end this right now and i'm this that was a great session by the way we enjoy, we really enjoyed it a lot thank you so thank much thank you very much bye bye bye